You're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. We should build an open world economy, uphold the multilateral trading regime, discard discriminatory and exclusionary standards, rules, and systems, and take down barriers to trade, investment, and technological exchanges. Hello and welcome to the China Geopolitics Podcast. I am Finbar Birmingham on the Political Economy Desk at the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong. It is the last Friday of January and 2021 has already been a humdinger on the geopolitical front. China continues to grow its influence in the trade sphere with deals and upgraded treaties with Western partners while the new Biden administration is getting its feet under the table and doling out tough rhetoric towards Beijing in a series of confirmation hearings for top officials this week. Over the past seven days, we had some clues as to how China might try to play its hand over the coming year. Xi Jinping addressed the World Economic Forum at Davos via video link, and his messaging was was pretty much the same as it has been for years now. China is open for business and a backer of globalization. But with China growing more confident and aggressive on the foreign policy front, some are finding that these words are hard to tally with reality. Our political economy editors, Joe Xin and John Carter, will be with me in the first half of the show to discuss the Davos speech and the reaction it gleaned in Washington, Canberra and, of course, Beijing. While in the second half of the show, I'll be joined by Nick Marrow, a global trade lead at the Economist Intelligence Unit in Hong Kong, to discuss the EU-China bilateral investment. Treaty. This was signed just a month ago and it's caused a bit of a diplomatic storm in Washington, while it's also faced staunch criticism around Europe. In Beijing, though, it has quite rightly been viewed as a bit of a success. Nick will help us dissect the pros and cons of the deal and discuss whether it is the game changer which both sides have portrayed it to be. But the first voices you'll hear on this week's show are those of Xi Jinping at Davos, along with simultaneous translation of the speech provided by CGTN. Then we'll have some analysis from the guys. Here we go. First, we should stay committed to openness and inclusiveness instead of closeness and exclusion. Multilateralism is about having international affairs addressed through consultation and the future of the world decided by everyone working together. To build small circles or start a new Cold War, to reject, threaten or intimidate others, to willfully impose decoupling, supply disruption or sanctions, and to create isolation or estrangement, will only push the world into division and even confrontation. We should build an open world economy, uphold the multilateral trading regime, discard discriminatory and exclusionary standards, rules and systems, and take down barriers to trade, investment and technological exchanges. We should strengthen the G20 as a premier forum for global economic governance engage in closer macroeconomic policy coordination and keep the global industrial and supply chains stable and open. That was, of course, the voice of Chinese President Xi Jinping speaking at the Davos World Economic Forum this week. The footage was courtesy of Chinese media CGTN. It's not the first time President Xi has addressed this summit. In 2017, he became the first Chinese head of state to address Davos, which is, of course, the world-famous gathering of the global elite. Back then, he said, we must remain committed to developing global free trade and investment and promote trade and investment liberalisation. So there's a bit of overlap between 2021 Xi Jinping and 2017 Xi Jinping. I'm joined today by our political economy editors, Zhou Xin and John Carter, to point out some of the changes that have happened in between times, even if the rhetoric is fairly consistent. 2017, Trump had just been elected, hadn't yet been inaugurated by the time she spoke. Fast forward to 2021, 
Joe Biden had been inaugurated five days previously. So the world is definitely different. Joe Shin, and I wanted to bring you in to talk first of all about what's the difference between China in terms of its 2017 place in the world, foreign policy, domestic situation and 2021. Now, I understand that's a massive question, so you don't have to answer it on every front, but give us a few headlines. Well, I think the biggest change is uh, China is becoming more confident. And uh, if you look at uh, what have happened in the past four years, you can see China has managed the uh, you know the trade war. China has managed the uh, coronavirus, um, you know, better than most of the countries in the world. And China also celebrated its 70th anniversary, which offered a chance for Beijing to really uh, boost the patriotism among its people, especially among the young people who were born after the 1989 Tiananmen Square uh, uh, pro-democracy movement. So you can see that China is becoming more, um, how to say, more conf- have more confidence in itself, in its management, in its governance system, its development model. And that's why when she came to Davos again, he was making it very clear to everyone saying, you know, uh, everyone, every country has a right to pick up its own governance model, have its own development path. So, you know, stop criticizing China as a, uh, you know, communist party ruling, one party rule or authoritarian regime. This is a, this is a, something that derived from China's own history. It's part of China's own choice. And it proved effective or even better than yours. So stop criticizing us and mm-hmm. shut up and go back to your own work. Yeah. That's a message I think I can take from the Davos speech. Uh, by uh, President Xi. At the same time, he is sending also a very reconsideratory uh, tone to the rest of the world, saying, you know, it's quite, because Davos is more for like a global elites, right, for, for political and business uh, elites. So his message is quite uh, clear that, you know, China is still pro-business. You know, despite all of the uh, criticisms against China, China will open the door to the rest of the world, especially, you know, Wall Street, uh, invest in banks if you want to make some money. You know, here is a chance. Uh, if you want to sell your products to the huge um, Chinese market, you know, we are we are we are here, ready ready for you. So this is a quite a uh, this is a quite a consistent message from uh, President Xi. On one hand, you know, China has to stick its own truth and pass, which means one party rule, the, the absolute control of the Communist Party of the whole society. On the other hand, you know, uh, without that. Uh, Unchallenged, you know, China will be as pragmatic as before in terms of business and commerce. Mm. Some reaction to the speech, um, not not directly to the speech, but which shows that maybe things haven't changed in terms of uh, the reception China is going to get in the wider world, even if the personnel has shifted slightly. Um, in a confirmation hearing in Washington this week, um, Joe Biden's nominee for the Commerce Secretary position, Gina Raimondo, said China's actions have been anti-competitive, hurtful to American workers and businesses, coercive, and as you point out there, are culpable for atrocious human rights rights abuses. Those are the words of Gina Raimondo. Um, We also had some strong blowback from the Australian treasurer, uh, Josh Frydenberg, who, of course, Australia has been engaged in a bit of a a tussle with China over the course of 2020 and into 21. He responded to a statement from Xi Jinping, which said, the strong should not bully the weak. Decisions should not be made by simply showing off strong muscles or waving a big fist. In response, Frydenberg said that, well, we agree with sentiment that big nations should not bully small ones. But there seems to be a bit of a disconnect between the words and the actions. The reality is Australia has been on the receiving end of some pretty harsh actions when it comes to our trade. So John Carter, I mean, again, big messaging from Xi Jinping. Um, Not much of a reception from uh, Western countries like Australia and from America. Are these words just more the same out of Beijing or is there some grounding in them? Well, China has certainly has um, reason to be pleased with itself because of its success in controlling the coronavirus and the recovery of its economy. As we know, um, while China's growth rate of 2.3 percent is relatively low, it is the only major country in the world, major economy in the world to show growth last year. So they have reason to be proud. Having said that, uh, their diplomatic relations remain fraught. On the one hand, they can say, okay, we've just concluded a big a multilateral trade negotiation, the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership, with 14 other countries. And we have uh, just concluded an investment treaty with the European Union, and we have just 
upgraded our free trade agreement with New Zealand. On the other hand, they have continuing conflicts with the United States, with Canada, with the UK, and mostly with Australia. India? And India. Mm. As we saw this week, India permanently banned a number of uh, Chinese apps, Tencent and others, which are very popular in the rest of the world. And so China has work to do, and it's a question of whether they're going to back down or change their approach. Um, but uh, Xi's talk of openness in working together rings hollow in certain quarters. And this it remains to be seen how this will play out in the years to come. Yeah. Do you think, uh, Zhou Xin, this is a conscious thing in the halls of power in, in Beijing? Um, is it a conscious strategy to be more aggressive on foreign policy um, and perhaps try and engage in more multilateral uh, commercial dealings, you know, in terms of at least those deals we talked about, uh, obviously the Australia situation is different. Um, is this a, a, an actual dual strategy, do you think? Well, I think China is deliberately showing to the world that China is no longer a weak or a, a second-hand you know, developing country that everyone can criticize its own leadership or the governance. China has more confidence to, uh, uh, let's put this word, to shout back when China was yelled at on the uh, international arena. And it, particularly regarding, uh, you know, what China takes as its core interests, what China takes as its um, the given rights that should not change. The, the ruling of the Communist Party, for instance, the, uh, its, um, um, its sovereignty over Xinjiang, Tibet, and Hong Kong, and how Beijing decides the way to govern them, uh, and uh, the ultimate unification, reunification with Taiwan. For instance, these, these kind of issues, China was no longer going to say, okay, if you are criticizing us, we just to keep quiet. You know, China will be more and more willing to, um, to shut back, and, uh, and if... Uh, Countries like Australia goes a little bit too far, and China think like we need to set an example, and China will not be shy anymore mm. to using its economic, financial, and the diplomatic muscle to get the message. Mm. Yeah, the Australia example is very current. Of course, it's nothing necessarily new in the fact that China has done it with the Philippines with regard to the banana war after the territorial dispute. Um, Canada they banned canola over the Mung Wong joke stuff. Uh, Norway salmon. Uh, Leo Chabot. They, so, um, but some of the things that haven't really been picked up that widely in the um, in the uh, Xi speech. Um, I was reading a little bit about this myself. Um, China is, is is in a sense we hear a lot of reaction from the Western world, from Australia, from the United States, from Europe. Um, but for the developing world, there's probably some quite important messaging in there as well, as Joe Shin says about systems of governance, about sort of open uh, trade and, and, and non-judgmental trade in a sense. And, you know, as it happened last year with the um, with the European Union trying to ban the export of PPE, it's now trying to ban, the, well, there was a story that the European Union had, Germany in particular, had tried to ban the, the export of vaccines. Um, it is quite interesting to hear she say this on one hand while the European Union is trying to essentially make sure that the vaccines can't get out to the developing world, John. Dynamic is is certainly quite spicy there. Well, indeed. I mean, um, just looking at vaccines, uh, there's a, the whole question of vaccine diplomacy. Um, China is seen and has been seen for a number of years as the uh, the uh, the voice of the developing world, which it, it said and, and rightfully so had been underrepresented in the global discussion about economic development. And so it has gained political capital through that discussion. Um, and the Belt and Road Initiative to improve infrastructure throughout uh, Asia and in Africa and in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, which are underdeveloped, has earned it lots of points. And now with the new theme is vaccine diplomacy. It will try to um, um, sell its or give away its vaccine to developing countries. Indonesia has just um, placed an order for a large amount of Chinese vaccines. And this is a way for China, uh, on the one hand, to help its friends and also to score points in the global discussion mm -hmm. about who's doing the most to help the rest of the world. Uh, the WTO was very clear in saying that protectionism of vaccines, if you will, the willingness of developed countries 
to keep those vaccines at home and not distribute them to the rest of the world um, was a moral dilemma. Mm-hmm. And it was something that needed to be addressed right away. Now, we've seen the United States has rejoined the WTO. This discussion is in its early stages under the new Biden administration. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Mm-hmm. Still waiting for some direction on the WTO, actually. But it's rejoined Gavi the, um, and the World Health Organization. Yeah. What did I say? WTO. WTO. Oh, I, yes. <laughs> We're still well, waiting to hear about that. It hasn't yeah, actually no, left. No, but no, I, meant, I meant the WHO. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Um a couple of days on from uh, Davos, we saw New Zealand topping up its free trade agreement with China. John, you know, it's as you mentioned earlier on the podcast, um, it's one of the f- one of the number of deals China's advanced or secured in, in recent months, and it's interesting to see Australia and New Zealand, the two neighbours in the southern hemisphere, their approaches to China differ. What do you read into New Zealand uh, going along with this deal? Well, New Zealand, uh, let's consider it from the point of view of the Five Eyes country. That's the five Anglo-Saxon English-speaking countries, United States, Canada, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. New Zealand is by far the smallest, but it's always going its own way. You know, for instance, New Zealand has always banned U.S. ships coming to its country with nuclear weapons as, as a we do our th- our things our way. And they've always had pretty good relations with China. And that was just improved. They have had a free trade agreement with China. And as part of that agreement, after five years, you can sit down and talk about upgrading that agreement, which they have done and completed this week. And that's a major contrast with Australia, which had the same opportunity a month ago and didn't do it because of the conflict that they've had for all since last April. And so here you have New Zealand, which is one of the five eyes. And the five eyes share intelligence. They have a general sense of the same Ideolo- sec- ideology or security say? issues. Yeah. yeah, in general, uh, not specifically in certain instances, but in general, and they share intelligence because mm. they trust each other. You have New Zealand that has a very good relationship with China, at least on the trade front. And then you have the other four or five ice countries. Mm-hmm. United States has a problem, as we well know. Canada has a number of problems, the, um, uh, the uh, Huawei CFO being the biggest one, the UK over BNO passports and a number of other issues, uh, 5G, for instance, and Australia, many, <laughs> a whole series of problems. Mm-hmm. And so can New Zealand be some sort of mediator for the rest of the five eyes, to bring China and the four other countries together to Mm -hmm. see if there's common ground where relations could be improved. That remains to be seen. It's early days. But the, the thought has occurred, and Biden, new president, wanting to improve Chinese ties perhaps to the extent that he can, mm-hmm. might decide he can take advantage of uh, New Zealand's hospitality to do this, much as Singapore did in negotiations between Taiwan and the mainland uh, a decade ago. And we'll see what happens. Mm. Joe Shin, is that something that's been talked about in, in China as well? I mean, what's the general sense... New Zealand has been very diplomatic in its relationship with China. It hasn't gone to the same lengths to sort of vocally criticize over anything, really. It's, it's, it no, tries it's, to keep it's, itself to itself. No, as John said, you know, this is very interesting because as the only one of the five eyes, you know, Ch- China is almost like, like uh, New Zealand, you know, and uh, Every time when, uh, you know, the United States says, let's do something, and, you know, Australia will be the first, day, yeah, yeah, let's do something, and New Zealand will, hold on, let's wait for a while. Is it really good for uh, the interest of New Zealand? And every time China, I think, remembers, you know, this kind of, like, you do me a favor now, I will do you a favor in the future, mm-hmm. this kind of thing. Yeah. We'll wait and see what sort of favors New Zealand's going to call on down the line, but it uh, should be worth watching. Uh, just briefly to wrap up, guys, tell me uh, what is on your agenda and what is on the economy and geopolitics agenda for the coming days. Well, on the data scene, we have um, the uh, Purchasing Managers Index due on Sunday, the 30th of January, looking back at January. Now, the Chinese economy was doing very well in the fourth quarter, growth of uh, 6.5%, which was uh, slightly better than in the fourth quarter of 2019 before the coronavirus. So the Chinese economy had a lot of forward momentum. And then came the resurgence of the coronavirus in northern China. 
the worst outbreak since March of last year. So what has this done? This comes just before the major uh, Chinese New Year holiday, which is like the combination of Christmas and Easter rolled into one. It's a big holiday. Traditionally, hundreds of millions of people leave the big cities and go home to their hometowns, celebrate with their families, bring presents, spend a lot of money. Will this happen this year? Chinese governments around the country are saying, don't go home, stay there. Mm. This could have a dramatic economic impact. And so the PMIs on Sunday, we'll see if that has already affected sentiment about the outlook for the economy. Mm. Zhu Xin, you're going to be grounded in Hong Kong for Chinese New Year. Yes. Tell us about generally, I mean, uh, is it frustrating not to be able to get back to families? It's been a long year for everybody personally. And I guess from the point of view, when you speak to people in in the mainland, is this really a a massive topic of conversation? Yes, it is a massive topic of conversation. And, you know, this is a this is really extraordinary for Chinese society, because like going back home for the Lunar Chinese New Year is almost on everyone's uh, mind. Uh, So this is uh, this is really the first time that you know the government has clearly uh, told its people like let's cancel this holiday or let's spend the holiday in a different way so it's very interesting mm-hmm. and what's on your agenda for the coming coming days and week well for now i think uh, we uh, if you care about china us relationship i think both sides kind of showing a willingness to more uh, engagement but neither side want to be seeing a hurry so at this moment, we can uh, see that the very small changes, mostly from the Washington side, you know, uh, a little bit relaxing here. You know, you can read this as a relaxation or more of like, OK, the technical thing. And then we can see from the Beijing side where the, you know, Beijing, of course, want to have a get more get a better relationship with Washington. So whether Beijing is uh, willing to answer that. And if we can see more of these kind of, uh, you know, on both sides, we may have the better expectations of the of the Sino-U.S. relationship mm-hmm. in the coming months. And overnight, we saw a small example of this. Uh, President Trump had um, issued an executive order banning Americans from investing in companies related to the Chinese military. That was supposed to go into effect January 27th. The Biden administration overnight postponed that into May and so that they could review the policy, mm-hmm. the implication being that it could be changed and or may not be changed. But it mm-hmm. it's a small signal that we may not do the same thing that the Trump administration did. And another signal is, you know, Biden has specifically banned to call the virus a China virus yes, or yeah, Wuhan yeah, virus. Yeah, yeah. And Very. China, yeah, China hasn't <laughs> really officially responded. But I think this is like a... Beijing will get the message. Yeah, no, it's it's very important symbolic gesture towards China mm-hmm. that uh, it, this is not okay. That this we're going to stop doing this right away. Yeah, I think that's one thing we can all agree on. Very positive. Uh, but for now, that's been brilliant as ever, John Carter, Zhu Xin. Thank you very much. Almost exactly a month ago, the European Union and China signed their comprehensive agreement on investment, the CAI as it has since been named. Seven years of negotiations that sped up dramatically over the final weeks. The EU has released part of the text, but you can check out our reporting on leaked versions of the late negotiating text which we had in December. How big a deal is the CAI and what does it mean for EU-China relations? Joined today by Nick Marrow, the Global Trade Lead at the Economist Intelligence Unit here in Hong Kong, to discuss this. Nick, thanks a million for joining us. Good to have you back on the podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me back. You have been one of the economists who has been really looking at this in in detail. Um, And and I guess a, a simple place to start, Nick, is this something that we should be excited about in economic terms? Um, I guess it depends on what perspective you're looking at it, which is a very economist answer. Um, but uh, generally speaking, from my initial reading, and I think the reading of a lot of people as well, um, it doesn't really change. It doesn't really move the needle on a lot of issues uh, in terms of the economic and commercial reality between China and the EU. Um, and so on balance, I'm not super excited. Um, but um Right now, when we look at international economics, it's tied to things like global politics, uh, international relations, um, stuff like that. And considering that the overall global trade environment right now is in such a poor state, um, we're seeing heightened uh, moves around protectionism um, and a bit of a knee-jerk reaction against 
free trade and globalization, under that context, the CAI is still commendable in the sense that it does at least affirm a willingness to continue uh, to engage in uh, international partnership when it comes to free trade. Um, and so from, from that perspective, it's positive. But I think when you get into the details, um, it's a little bit more underwhelming than a lot of people would you know, expect. Exactly, Nick. Tell us um, just from each side of the of the deal, the EU and China. What would be your sort of main? What what is each side getting from this? Both, I guess, in economic terms and other ways. Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, let's start off with the EU, um, and I think it's it's worthwhile to discuss what's both side. What are both sides getting, and what are they not getting? <laughs> so I'll start off with the pessimistic stuff first. Um, and I should note that we have had about half of the agreement released publicly. Uh, we still don't have the full document, which I think is coming out in February. And the reason I mention that is a lot of the agreement deals with investment, as you'd expect. Um, but many of those investment provisions on the specific market access. Uh, conditions um, or uh, some of the related provisions, those are in an annex that have not yet been released. And so this is still somewhat postulating. We'll have to wait yeah, for... haven't been the, released, Nick, but if, if the listeners do want to read about them, they can check out our uh, our coverage from our leaked document. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, to get to the point there, um, from what we have seen, the investment in, uh, openings are really quite modest. Um, they seem to dovetail essentially with what China is really offering um, in terms of what foreign investors can do in its market, whether it was concessions that China offered as part of the US-China trade war or um, as part of what we call its negative list, which is the mechanism that uh, China uses to uh, regulate FDI into its market. The EU has, say, has said that um, they've gotten unprecedented access to things like healthcare, uh, the automotive industry, cloud computing services. But when you look down on it, it really, again, just mirrors exactly what China is really offering. Um, the EU has said, for example, that it's allowed its companies to get 50% ownership in cloud computing companies. Um, that's been the case in China for years. Uh, the EU has said that um, EU companies will be able to operate wholly foreign-owned hospitals and six or seven cities. Again, that's already been on offer since 2014. Um, they mentioned that the automotive sector is uh, opening up. That's been the case since 2018. <laughs> um, and so the, the question is really what, what is new? And so that's, that's kind of the, the pessimistic side. The optimistic side is that in China, a lot of it comes down to licensing, the idea that regulators are actually going to give you a license to operate. Um, I think the political optics of this deal suggest that European companies might be in a more advantageous position than they were before. I think China wants to show both the EU and the world that it's serious on its commitment to the CAI. And so this could lubricate the process a little bit uh, for a lot of those European firms who might have applied for a license uh, to operate in these sectors, but are still kind of on the waiting list. Yeah. There's, there's a bigger question around how sustainable that is. Do you need to enter into an investment agreement each time you want your companies to get a license? Um, but I mean, if we're looking for kind of the optimistic take, um, that licensing approval and that, that improved business environment optics, that would be it. Yeah. And, and for China, Nick, I mean, the European Union makes a big song and dance about the fact that it's already open to Chinese investment. So what's China getting from this? <laughs> That's the big question that we're still kind of trying to unpack ourselves, because Europe is relatively, or I shouldn't even say relatively, Europe is more open in terms of uh, its economy compared to China. Um, it doesn't have the same type of restrictions on inbound FBI, FDI that China has. Um, and I think if you look at a lot of the discussions around the CAI, the European side was very much pushing for this idea of rebalancing that economic relationship. Uh, and so from that perspective, it would be opening the Chinese markets to the same degree that the European market is open. But there are some lingering questions there. In the past couple of years, we've seen a bit more of a concerted effort to increase scrutiny over FDI from certain countries, including China. Um, and it's not clear that the CAI really addresses that, um, particularly because there are concerns that some of these provisions are explicitly aimed at China and it could end up being discriminatory. And so um, from what we've seen thus far, uh, it doesn't really look like Again, um, the environment is changing. Again, uh, that's not necessarily a big issue because Europe is open, but it does raise questions around you know the status of say Huawei, the Chinese telecommunications mm -hmm. equipment provider, which is trying to get involved in the five G rollout. What a lot of people are suspecting is that EU negotiators could have quietly promised Huawei access um, to 
portions of their 5G market. Now, SCMP had a, a great deep dive uh, scoop on that exact topic. Yeah. <laughs> and and well, we're not, or, go ahead. And I was just going to say, we were, I was on a webinar yesterday with um, Maria Martin Pratt, who's the, um, was the EU's chief negotiator, she sort of shot down these rumours, um, saying that these are not based in reality, that there hasn't been any side dealing on um, on Huawei. Um, you know, and what you refer to was part of the negotiating text which we'd seen, which saw that um, showed that Huawei, or sorry, the Chinese negotiators had tried to insert a clause in there that would um, essentially punish European states that um, barred Huawei from their network. But I mean, don't think they made it into the final agreement and the EU has uh, been insistent that there aren't any side deals on this. However, I don't think they're really going to come out and say it if there was anyway, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that one. <laughs> That's true. We'll have to wait and see. And I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's no reason to doubt the EU side on, in terms of their pushback, but um, from the Chinese side, uh, this is probably a priority of theirs. We, we saw this during the US-China negotiations as well. And so considering that, in theory, some of these texts are still being scrubbed and um, there's still some room for adjustment. We, we could see the Chinese side continue to push on this. And so, I mean, if that does happen, that would be a bit more of a noteworthy concession. Um, but again, we don't really have any evidence of that yet. Uh, and so we'll have to kind of wait and see how that all develops. Yeah. For China, I mean, um, economics aside, the politics of this and the symbolism of this is strong. I mean, like China this week, um, as we discussed earlier in the podcast with our editors, um, upgraded its free trade agreement with New Zealand. Um, at the end of last year, it signed the European the, the CAI with Europe, the European Union. And just prior to that, a few months earlier, it signed the RCEP with 14 Asia-Pacific economies. So, I mean, uh, when you hear Xi Jinping's rhetoric at Davos as well, I mean, there's clearly some um, optics that Beijing is going for here, Nick, and I suppose um, having the wherewithal to sign um, a comprehensive investment agreement with one of the world's economic superpowers. That, you know, it doesn't look too shoddy for Beijing given the current political climate that it exists in. That's exactly right. And I think if we talk about kind of the positives and negatives of the European uh, investment agreement with China, um, it kind of skews a bit more towards the political optics in terms of where the benefit is for China. Um, I mentioned how the market conditions aren't really changing, but China is positioning itself as a key uh, economic and, by extension, political partner for a lot of these markets, particularly at a time when we're expecting Joe Biden, the new US president, to begin uh, exploring more of a multilateral approach on international engagement with China. Um, I think by engaging with the Europeans over the CAI, in upgrading the New Zealand FTA, um, finishing RCEP with Asia, China is essentially trying to ensure that a type of you know multilateral diplomatic coalition doesn't emerge against it. Which I mean, I think I mean no country wants to choose sides between China and the U.S. That's the nightmare scenario for everyone. But I think when you have these procedures and um, these institutions in place by way of investment or trade agreements. Um, um, it kind of solidifies uh, those links even further and makes the choice tougher. China knows that. Um, and so diplomatically, I'd say this is quite important for China and, and a bit more significant than um, the economics of the agreement, particularly because, again, China is not yielding all that much. And it doesn't look like the Europeans are yielding all that much either. Um, Absolutely. So yeah. yeah. Probably a political issue. Indeed, Nick. The forced labor provisions of the CAI have attracted a lot of column inches, um, given the the endless coverage we're having now of alleged forced labor conditions in the Xinjiang region of, of Western China. Um, are you surprised or not so much by the, I guess, the standard of, of, of what's in that deal? Um, would you have expected it to be stronger or do you think that's not really a negotiable for, for China? Uh, yes and no. So surprised in the sense that I think the CAI took all of us by surprise, all of the observers of this process by surprise in the fact that the Europeans weren't able to get a stronger commitment by China before they agreed to sign. Um, it wasn't surprising that China would push back on that, um, just knowing China's approach to not just forced labor, but the Xinjiang issue in general. Xinjiang denies these allegations, or China denies these allegations in Xinjiang. Um, and so I guess the, the outcome itself wasn't surprising, but the fact that the Europeans were okay with it was surprising, just because this has been an issue that the European Union has positioned as a, a core area of its 
foundational principles, um, not just as it operates as a block, but how it operates, um, you know, when engaging with other markets. Yeah. Um, I think when you compare it to how Europe has engaged with other uh, countries via FTAs, for example, um, it's also a little bit less surprising in terms of how this has played out in the deal. Um, so I think SCMP, you, you've pointed out that um, the forced labor kind of if there are disputes around the commitments to it, it's not subject to the dispute settlement mechanism actually in the CAI. It's over a panel of experts, but that seems to be replicated by EU practice elsewhere. Um, we see that with uh, the labor dispute um, between the EU and South Korea, for example. Yeah. But I think, I mean, this is tricky considering that uh, the labor disputes in South Korea are probably in nature quite different from what's happening in Xinjiang. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it's the timings uh, on that front. I mean, the Korean situation back in 2009 when the EU and Korea signed their free trade agreement, I don't think there was any allegations of um the extent that exists against Xinjiang. Exactly. Um, so, so, so it is an interesting dynamic. Um, you know, a couple of points to add on that, Nick, is that um, on this webinar with the EU negotiator yesterday, she was very insistent that um, this is only part of the EU strategy towards China. Um, they have autonomous measures which are in the works to deal with forced la- perceived or alleged forced labour. Um, they are, by the middle of the year, hoping to introduce uh, at least a draft legislation regarding um, forced labour in the supply chain. And I, I don't know how much that sort of reflects or mirrors the, the similar legislation we've seen in the United States coming out of the Congress over the past year or 18 months. Um, but it does seem to be along those lines. And just before Christmas, you'll rec- recall the EU, all the European Commission also um, passed uh, something which has been compared to the Magnitsky suite of, of sanctions legislation, which allows it to, it to unilaterally engage in um, human rights related sanctions on, on 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 entities around the world so the argument for the european from the european union and the commission is that they're building separate tools to deal with forced labor uh, they do feel like the the kai gives them some leverage um you know uh, as we've seen with korea they just had a sort of drawn out um drawn out case where they Koreans weren't seen to be making enough progress towards meeting their international labor organization ratification processes as is laid out in that free trade agreement. But I mean, 11 years and Korea still hasn't implemented that and the panel found that they didn't even breach the agreement. So, I mean, the criticism is that this won't really hold Beijing's feet to the fire with regard to forced, forced labor allegations at all. I think that's exactly right. Um, I mean, it, it comes down to enforcement. And I mean, considering that the EU and South Korea, just like you said, uh, there, there doesn't seem to really have been any punitive measures that have yet been adopted in, in response to this. It raises the question uh, of whether um, this is an appropriate way to, to deal uh, with the, the, the risks around this issue. Um, and if you are genuinely interested in getting China to adhere or to eventually ratify the ILO conventions, um, how much faith can you really put into this process? Um, I think what's also interesting um, beyond all of this, which I think is very valid in terms of the enforcement and what's happening separately, is if you do look at these separate provisions that that are happening in the EU, whether it's the Magnitsky-like sanctions passed by the European Parliament um, or whatever. I mean, we've heard this from... um, European officials as well, in that um, there, there'll be a kind of more of a piecemeal approach to how to deal with this. The question is, is China okay with that? <laughs> I mean, um, you can come out with unilateral actions on this as much as you want. Um, but my big question is, the Chinese side probably looks at the agreement as somewhat being the end game in how both sides are going to approach this issue. Um, and so if you come out with separate provisions that penalize China on this issue or that establish a completely separate enforcement and monitoring mechanism that lies outside of the CAI, would China see that as acting in bad faith? Um, yeah, and yeah. could that in turn derail some of the lightly positive aspects of this agreement? Um, and so I think that strategy is is not invalid, but it's worrisome in terms of how it's actually going to be implemented. And ultimately, it's going to have to run up against uh, 
um, the perceived benefits of the CAI, where there are people who've been pushing for it for a long time, who then might now be very reticent um, to embrace separate pieces of legislation or measures mm-hmm. or whatever that could undermine it. And so this yeah. just looks very messy. In my yeah, opinion. and the ratification journey in the European Parliament is also going to be interesting because, I mean, um, you know, this is not something that has been greeted warmly across the board. Um, <laughs> you know, the timing is is one thing. Um, you know, and as some a point somebody else made on this webinar, which the European negotiator was speaking yesterday, the day before, was, um, I mean. Is Beijing going to take kindly to its name being dragged through the mud, having, uh, you know, I guess, made these perceived con- concessions to the European Union? Um, the point made was that China is not Singapore, it's not Vietnam, you know, it's not Canada. Um, so, you know, it doesn't really like to have that sort of criticism <laughs> angled at it. So I think that's going to be a bit of a bit of an interesting one to watch as well. Definitely. I agree. Um, I mean, there's, there's a bit of a positive, what we'd call an upside risk here in the sense that China knows that there's going to be a lot of criticism. And so it might act um, to issue some of those, say, licensing approvals for European companies to enter into sectors that they've pr- previously been uh, restricted in um, as, as a sign of goodwill or a good faith to committing to the agreement. Um, because at the end of the day, a lot of this is being driven by corporate interests um, and by investment interests. And so if China is able to kind of sweeten the prospects of the deal, by showing, look, we are sticking to our word. We are letting some of these big guys into the market. Here's evidence of that. Um, that could be positive for those companies and for the perceptions of European business. But again, I don't think that's going to necessarily change the optics around human rights um, yeah. or yeah. even the other stuff around you know, subsidies, government procurement, um, all of the stuff that, that we haven't touched on in it today's podcast. Like a whole other podcast, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, Nick, before we finish up, I just want to ask you a question about the, your, your focus because, I mean, you're the global trade lead for the Economist Intelligence Unit based in Hong Kong. So, I mean, like, like myself, probably you've been absorbed by US-China <laughs> trade war and stuff over the past couple of years with the change in administration in, um, in the White House with European China issues becoming more prominent with a whole load of other stuff going on, Australia, China and everything. I mean, are you expecting to sort of pivot your focus this year? Um, are you still expecting to be focused very heavily on the United States and China? Where, where, where do you see that going? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I guess to contextualize it, for example, last year, um, around this time, I was expecting the big kind of trade story of the day to be US-EU everything around the digital services tax, everything around the Airbus Boeing dispute. And that's how things looked like they were going until COVID hit. (laughs) And then it completely um, messed up that strategy. Um, We might look at the COVID effects on trade. This year, um, who knows what's going to happen. The recovery from COVID um, for global trade flows, as well as trade policy, that's going to be a big thing. Um, As well as the idea that if you look at how national governments are responding to COVID in terms of subsidies or some support, that has questions around trade protectionism. We just Mm -hmm. saw news broke uh, yesterday about how the EU might be restricting some vaccine exports. So this idea of vaccine protectionism is going to be really big. And then, of course, when it comes to these regional issues, we're seeing Joe Biden's administration still kind of um, find its footing in terms of how it wants to approach China. We're still expecting a maintenance of a lot of uh, Donald Trump's policies, but how those are maintained, whether new restrictions are enforced, um, whether we see new surprises, that's those are all going to be questions um, related to US-China. And then the us EU China kind of trilateral dynamic, I think, is also going to be a really, really interesting story to watch, particularly because, as you mentioned before, after the EU and China signed the CAI, or they, they indicated uh, intention to sign the CAI, um, there was a lot of question around what this meant for the US EU relationship, yeah. precisely because I think Biden wants to coordinate with the EU more on China and the EU wants to emphasize its strategic autonomy in this area. And so that, I think, is going to be a pretty fascinating uh, dynamic to look at because these issues aren't going to go away anytime soon. Yeah. Sounds like a quiet year ahead. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Great stuff. Okay, Nick, well, we will catch up with you and, and check in through the year. But uh, thanks again for coming on the show and have a great weekend. Thanks for having me. Happy weekend to you too. Thanks for listening to this week's China Geopolitics podcast with me, Finbar Birmingham, on the Political Economy Desk at the South China Morning Post. You can keep up to date on all things related to China, geopolitics, trade and the rest at scmp.com. Follow us on Twitter at scmp economy. I am at F Birmingham. 
We'll be back next week. Until then, stay safe, wash your hands, wear your mask and keep your distance. All the best. For more podcasts from the South China Morning Post, head to scmp.com, where you can hear more about technology, trade, culture and society.